just like today, just being faithful, just being faithful. This morning, uh, I want to pr- bring the word of the Lord to you, but before I do, I want to share a couple things. One of the, one of the things in this season of my life is I've, I've planted, I've pastored, I've done a lot of you know, missionary work, I've done a lot of things, but this is, this is an exciting time in my life because it flows according to the giftedness that God has given me. My, my role is more of an apostolic role, and most of the time when I minister in churches, it's an apostolic word. It's a word for the church to move, not individuals, but for the church to move in the direction that God has for it. And, and I enjoy that role. I enjoy that kind of, of, of ministry and gift. But as I begin to pray about this church, about this day, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you're you're not given an apostolic word. You're going to give an individual word. How many of you guys remember hearing this in the New Testament? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. How many of you remember hearing that? Man, as a kid, I thought, man, there must be a lot of deaf people back then. He who has ears to hear, I mean, doesn't everybody have ears? They must be deaf if, if he's saying that. You know, that's not what Jesus meant. Jesus meant that the word was going to be spoken and some of them would receive it because they're listening not with the physical ear but the spiritual ear. Come on, somebody. And I say this morning to you, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The message that I am sharing with you today is a message that God wants you to hear. And there are some nuggets and some truths in there that you need to get a hold of because I believe that God is calling us to a higher level. I believe God, in these last days, God is looking for those who are sold out, those who are willing to put their best foot forward, those who are willing to say, I'm going to lay it all on the line. I'm going to give it all to the king. Come on, somebody. He's looking for more men and women to say, I only get so many years here on earth to serve God. I have eternity to do what I want. My life is going to be his. Listen, I told God a long time ago, my life is not my own. It's yours. It belongs to you. So he who has ears to hear, I want you to hear this morning what the Spirit of the Lord says. In Luke chapter 18, I want you to look with me at verse number 35, a very familiar passage of Scripture. And I believe that this morning I want to pull some spiritual truths from this text that I believe is going to encourage you, convict you, but more than anything else, propel you to take some steps because I believe that God is ordering some steps this morning. I believe God is speaking. If you would listen this morning, don't listen. Don't listen to the preacher. Listen to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit begins to commune with your heart. Can you say amen? It says in Luke chapter 18, verse 35, then it happened as he was coming near Jericho, talking about Jesus, that a certain blind man sat by the road and he was begging. Hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him, Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went and warned him that he should be quiet. Did he be quiet? Listen, we've got to be tenacious in these last days. I don't know about you, but the enemy has never fought fair, and he's definitely not fighting fair now. Let me tell you something. The enemy is not fighting. Listen, we need tenacious Christians who don't take no for an answer. We need more men like like David who held on to the horns of the altar even though he wasn't supposed to. He held on. He said, I'm not letting go until I get what I've come for. So what did he do? He cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Say that with me. Your faith has made you well. Not your asking, but your faith has made you well. And immediately received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, began to give praise to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is in this room and present. We thank you for the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the comforter the convictor who is in this room today. Lord, if there's, if there's anybody here whose mind is preoccupied with other things, Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would begin to melt away those things and put those things aside. Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear what you are saying to us as individuals. What are you saying to me? What are you calling me out from? Where are you calling me to? Lord, Speak to us in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. 
when I turned 30 years old, I told my wife, you know, I've, I've always been an adventurer. Uh, one time in one of our churches, we did this little project where we passed out these little papers, and on these papers, they asked questions about uh, uh, these specific questions. You didn't answer them about yourself. You draw a name out, and you had to answer them about somebody else. And so somebody had my name. Somebody from the church had my name, and, and one of the things on there said, if, 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 and you put that person's name in there, so someone else in the church is answering this question about me. If Josh won a million dollars and only had 24 hours to spend it, what would he spend it on? Now, I promise you, this was their answer. He would pay his tithe, he would build a church and buy a lot of big boy toys. That person knew me. Turning 30 years old and, you know, how, how many knows when you, you know you're getting older when you wake up and fill places you didn't know you used to have? You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, man, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do this. So, baby, I want to buy me an ATV. She says, why do you want an ATV? I said, I don't know, but I want an ATV. I said, I'm 30 years old. If I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. So we went, and I bought, I bought a brand-new ATV, man. I was so excited. I got that thing home nice and shiny and pretty, fired that thing up, and it's loud and obnoxious, and I'm burning up ruts in the yard and playing around in that thing. And then a buddy of mine says, oh, that looks like fun. So he went and got him one. And, man, we would, we would wait till all the families went to bed, and we'd go out at night and just terrorize on these things. Man, it was a blast. Now I think to myself, before, it's still sitting in my garage, by the way, but now I look at it and I think to myself, how many days of pain if I ride that today? But I'm not giving it up. So I'll never forget, I, I had this thing. Now, you know, they're not cheap. A lot of good hard-earned money went into this. But I'm an adventurer. So I bought this four-wheeler. Me and my buddy went on this little trip. And we go down, there's an old abandoned railroad track. The tracks have been pulled up, and we're just, just having a time of our life. We get to this one spot, it's like, wow, man, somebody's been here before. A lot of these trails, and, man, I get up to the top of this trail, and I look down, I'm like, oh, wow, that looks fun. Really steep hill that kind of just traversed left and right. And, man, there's there's these deep ruts in the road. And, and then at the bottom, there was this mud-looking thing, and I'm like, <laughs> it just called my name. My buddy says, man, you better not do that. I said, oh, as soon as you just tell me, I better not do it. You just might as well just dared me, right? So I, get down, I go down that hill, and I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to navigate away from these very deep ruts because these ruts are, like, deep. Uh, it wasn't just ATVs that were doing this. They were, like, full-size Jeeps and 4 by 4s you know what I mean? So some of them ruts were huge. And I'm trying, to, I'm trying my best to stay away from those things and get a little bit of speed because I know that mud is going to be thick, and to get through it, I'm going to have to plow through that mud. And, man, I'm, I'm going that, and, man, it yanked it right into that rut. And I was committed then. There was no getting out of it. There's no backing up. No put it in reverse. I mean, I'm going, I'm going at a grade like this. So what I do is I just floored it. Gave it all it had. Whoa! And little unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize that that mud pit was just a little bit deeper than my ATV. And all of a sudden, I buried it up, and the mud was all the way up to here. My ATV completely under mud. And you've seen these bubbles go as it was still running underneath there. How it was running, I don't even know. Man, I tried my best. I'm trying to do it. I'm just, I am making mud soup. I'm trying my best to get out of that thing. I mean, it was, it, it, listen, this wasn't, this wasn't just any ordinary mud. This mud been there a while. It was rancid, it stank, it was thick, it was gross, it was everywhere. I'm throwing mud left and right. I'm trying to, I mean, it took us hours to get my ATV out of that mud. I mean, it literally took us hours. And then when I got it out, I looked at it, and it just looked like a big big mud ball. And I thought, wow, that's, that's terrible. This thing's brand new. I can't, I can't take it home like this. My wife would kill me. So I drove it down into the river, and I started driving through the river. <laughs> Man, I made, I, made, I made that river. I bet every fish for, for miles, that just, that, who's this guy? So I got it cleaned up. And if I, I mean, literally, I'm not joking. This took out. I wish I could tell you everything we had to do to get it out of there, but time would not permit me. I mean, it was, it was an absolute pain. Man, you would think that somebody had learned their lesson. And I told my buddy, I said, hey, I think I can do it. He says, 
think you can do what? I said, I think I can go down that hill and make it to the other side. He said, man, don't do that. Why did he say that? You might as well just dared me. I drove up to the top of that hill. I got to the top. I read that engine. Rum, 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 rum. Boom, and away I went. I tried my best to keep my wheels out of those big deep ruts because I knew if they got into those deep ruts, it was going to drag me to the same old mud pit. And it did. And I buried it again. But this time I buried it worse because I was going a lot faster. Man, by the time I got that thing, I was so sore. I was hurting in places I didn't know. I was, and, and I, for days, I mean, what, what is it about boys that are, that are like this? For days I'm thinking, how could I try that again but make it this time? Now, has anybody ever done anything silly like that? Don't look at me like you got that. Uh-huh, I got some guy. Yeah, yeah. If there's one thing that COVID and the pandemic taught me is how easy it is for us to get stuck in ruts. Life throws you curveballs. Life doesn't happen the way you thought it should. And what happens is, is, is you, you get thrown into these positions that you really don't, not for sure how to navigate. And it just seems like no matter how hard you try, it keeps dragging you back to the same old place and the same old place and the same old place. I talked to you about some physical ruts, but how many of those are spiritual ruts in life? There are things in life that continue to drag us back to the same old place and the same old place. And just like I was foolish to try it again the second time, why is it that we as Christians will try it again the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, over and over, struggling with the same things, going down the same roads? And Man, I don't know about you, but uh, I've done this. I've come to the altar and given things to God and felt the power and presence of the Holy Spirit come and release things off my life. And I'm like, whoa, man, the freedom I feel. And then I'm walking out the back door, but realizing there's, you know, something's missing. Why is it that we keep navigating to the same old place, picking up the same old things and grabbing that thing? And, and, and let me tell you something, folks. Ruts not only pull you to places you don't want to be, they'll cost you things you didn't want to pay. Come on, somebody. A rut is something hard to get out of. It slows your progress. It keeps you from where you're supposed to be. And listen, if you continue to go down those same old ruddy roads, it's going to damage your vehicle. Irreversible damage to our lives. Listen, a spiritual rut is nothing more than a cleverly disguised and devilishly hidden trap to slow your spiritual progress, to keep you from where God wants you to be. And folks, listen, if you keep going down, it's ultimately going to hurt your spirit. What's your rut today? What is something you've been struggling? Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's misunderstanding, hurt feelings, disagreements, unconfessed sin, unforgiveness, rut of religion. Ooh, come on, somebody. That's a, someone told me one time, you're religious, aren't you? I said, I'd rather you cuss me out, but don't ever call me religious. I ain't got a religious bone in my body. I just got a relationship with Jesus. How many knows there's a difference? But you know how easy it is to get caught in the rut of religion? Matter of fact, may, may I dare to say religion's really never helped anybody? If you look over the course of our history, there's a lot of things done in the name of God that are, are tr literally disgusting and travesties. We don't turn people on to religion. We turn them on to what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. If you want to continue your, your spiritual progress and get to the level that God has called, listen, God, is not, God does not want you to stay where you're at. He wants to take you to where he wants you to be. But oftentimes, we get stuck where we're at. We get stuck in the rut of life. We get stuck in the rut of our way of thinking. We get stuck in this position. When God is trying to, to take you to the perfect plan, we just live in the permissive will because we allow these ruts to get in our way. Now, here in this text, there's a guy who was probably caught in the biggest rut of life. This guy was born blind. There was no welfare programs, no food stamps. There was no social programs to help people like him. He was raised up and his parents had to teach him how to beg. And every day he would go to the same place. Listen to this. Imagine this existence every single day being led. There's no blind dogs. There are no blind sticks. You get led to the same place, sat down, and day in and day out, you beg and you have to depend upon the generosity of others. You've got to be a better beggar than the other beggars. 
I remember as a young man, we went to Washington, D.C., and I took, I took some money with me, and I was excited to spend my money. I, I've, always, I've always been a, a, a good money person, so I, I had all this money saved. And, 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 and about two hours into this trip, I, I look over, and my mom, I asked my mom, I said, Mom, can I, can I borrow $5? She says, oh, did you leave your money in the hotel? I said, no, I, I'm out of money. She said, what do you mean you're out of money? I said, yeah, man, there's all these people around here asking for money, and they look pitiful. And she said, you gave them all money? Now, mind you, I'm only about 12 years old. I said, yeah, Mom, there's one guy who had no legs. Now, listen, the true story, I promise you this happened. On our way back to the car, that man with no legs got up and walked off with my money. Now, blind Bartimaeus was really blind, and he had a legitimate need. But how many knows, can you imagine your whole existence is being the better beggar? This guy was, if there was ever a rut, he was caught in rut. Right outside the road, just outside the city, this man is is wanting to get out of this rut of life. He doesn't know how, but he heard about a man. He heard about this guy who had spit in blind people's eyes and make mud, and they go down to the pool of Shalom and heal. He heard about a guy who would touch lame legs and they would begin to walk. He heard about a man. He heard a story. And when he heard a commotion that day, this was not pre-planned. This was not something he thought through. He says, what's the commotion? What's going on? Jesus is passing by. Immediately, immediately he went to work. Immediately he went to work. Immediately. Now, if you're taking notes, I I want you to jot some things down. And remember, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Don't listen to the English sentences I'm sharing, but listen to what God is saying to you through this message because I believe that God wants to, listen, I believe all of us, all of us have got things in our life that continue pulling us down and pulling us away and keeping us from God's perfect plan for our life. The enemy loves it. He don't care how, he he don't even care that you're here this morning. He just don't want you to take nobody with you. Come on, somebody. Let's take a deeper look and pull some truths out of here. Number one, if you're writing things down, if you want to break free, you've got to be willing to acknowledge that God is here and he is able. That God is here and he is able. Blind Bartimaeus just heard a story. He heard story after story after story of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth doing significant miracles and healings. And I mean, listen, one of the coolest miracles I think that Jesus ever did is when they're walking by and there's a funeral service and one of his disciples asked a stupid question. Have you ever asked a stupid question? Jesus could care less about even the answer to the question. He cared about the the mother who was hurting. And he raised her son from the dead. Can you imagine being a part of that? Can you imagine being a part? Can you imagine walking with Jesus and seeing those? Matter of fact, the Bible says that he did so many miracles that there was not enough room in the books of the day to contain it all. We only get, was it like 30 some days of Jesus' life are recorded in the scriptures? There's so much more to his life that we don't ever see. Miracle after miracle after miracle. This guy every day begging, 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 alms please, alms please. Someday he got a meal, someday he didn't. Someday he maybe was able to get something a little extra, someday he didn't get anything at all. And you imagine day in, day out, years upon years upon years upon years of frustrations. And he only heard the stories. And when he heard a commotion, he says, hey, what's going on? They said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Immediately, he recognized that God was here. Immediately. Not a second thought to it. Not only is he here, I know what he can do. Let me tell you something this morning. God is here. We're two or three are gathered together. He's there in the midst of them. You say, well, maybe God's there for someone else, but he ain't here for, he's here for you. He's here for me. He's here for all of us. Come on, somebody. We've got, if you want to break free from the things that are holding you back, you've got to recognize that not only is God here, but he is willing and wants to break us free. Number two, write this down. This is important. Second spiritual truth I find in this man's life is this. You got to be willing to ask God for help. Got to be willing to ask. 
He cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Mark chapter 10 is, is, a, is Mark's gospel, same story. He says, and when he had heard it, he said, Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You must be willing to drop your pride and ask God for help no matter the circumstances. The Bible says you have not because you want. You got to be willing to ask. If this guy would have just sat around and waited for Jesus to find him, He'd still be blind and begging. But he heard that he was passing by, acknowledged he was near, acknowledged that he could, and he cried out. Number three, this is good. Number three, assume responsibility for your own life. Quit blaming your rut on others. People can influence you, but they cannot get, make you get stuck. Ultimately, the choice is yours. Why? Because you have a free will. I learned a long time ago, nobody can make you happy, sad, mad, or glad. That's a switch you turn on in your own head. Now, people, people can, they can, they can add to it. Come on, somebody. They, they, can, they can put fuel on the fire, but people can't make you mad. You make yourself mad by allowing what they do to make you mad. Stop blaming the issues on everybody. Well, if I would have had a better mother, if I had a better father, grow up. I had a wonderful father. I had a wonderful mother. That doesn't mean they were perfect. They made mistakes. And I can sit here and say, well, I wouldn't be this way today if it wasn't for this, that, and the other. Listen, we got to eventually get over that and stop blaming our current situation on our past. Well, if we had a better pastor. That can't even be an excuse in this church. If I had this, if I had that. If so-and-so didn't say this about me, if so-and-so didn't say that about me, listen, whoever came up with the statement, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you, that person was a flat-out idiot. I've never had an 80-year-old guy in my office complaining that he broke his leg when he was 14 years old and he just never got over it. But I've had men sit in my office weeping and crying because a teacher spoke something over their life that was damaging to them. Come on, somebody. I mean, those words can't hurt. But we eventually got to say, you know what? I'm going to not believe what others say, what others think. I'm not going to allow what others say about me or do about me to keep me from where God wants me to be. I'm going to assume responsibility now, and I'm going to put my hand up and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I like, it. I like that he said, have mercy on me, because he knew he didn't deserve it. Listen, we don't deserve nothing. We deserve hell. We deserve every bad and negative thing that could happen to us. But, 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 but Jesus died on the cross and paid your penalty. He bought you back. Come on, somebody. I don't get to heaven because of who I am and what I've done. I get to heaven because who he is and what he did. Son of David, have mercy. So listen, some of you might just got to say, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. We got to stop blaming our issues. Well, if my mom and dad wouldn't have done this, maybe I wouldn't have been born blind. Well, this is a good one. I'm about to preach myself happy. It's probably my favorite if you're taking notes. Number four, stop worrying what others may say or think. And those who went before him warned him that he should be quiet. Was he quiet? He cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Mark chapter 10 says this, Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried all the more, Son of David, have mercy. Listen, worrying about what others say or think will only keep you blind and begging. Well, I, you know what? So-and-so don't think I deserve it. So-and-so said this about me. So-and-so said that. Stop worrying about others. Be willing to say, God, have mercy on me. You might not like me, but Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Come on, somebody. And it's not red and yellow, black and blue. Jesus loves me more than you. Come on, somebody. He loves us. Jesus don't do unto me what I deserve. 
he does unto me what he deserves. Stop blaming others and stop worrying what others think. Now is the time. Now is the time. Number five, write this down. This is a good one. Number five. Stop waiting for ideal circumstances. If you ever try to wait till the time is right, you might just never get a chance to break free. Well, you know, how many, how many people have told you this? Well, you know what, Pastor, I want to come to church sometime, but my life just ain't what it should be, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and maybe if I can get this done and do that, then maybe I could come to church and the ceiling won't fall in on. Listen, Jesus, we got a fisherman back here. How many times have you caught a fish and it was a fillet on your hook? Wouldn't that be sweet? That'd be awesome. Wouldn't it be awesome if his fish, <laughs> it's already, hey, it's already cooked. Sweet Jesus. It's not how it happens. You catch the fish, then you clean them, right? You catch the fish, then you clean them. You don't come to Jesus clean. You come to him and he cleans you. Come on, somebody. You don't have what it takes anyway. He has what it takes. It's not what I deserve. It's what he paid for. Come on, somebody. We have got to stop waiting for ideal circumstances. Listen to this. If this guy would have said, you know what, today might not be a good day because it sounds like Jesus is busy. Guess what? He would have died, he would have died blind and begging because Jesus never passed that way again. Some of us are missing our opportunities. We're missing divine appointments. We're missing points in time that God has revealed himself and says, I'm here, I'm here. But listen to me. One thing I know about God, he will not force himself. He will not make you. He will not come along. Listen, Jesus didn't call his name. He called Jesus' name. For all we know, Jesus didn't even know he was standing there. Let me tell you something, folks. Don't wait till you get your circumstances lined up. Well, pastor, you know what? I, if I'm going to do this thing, I want to do it right. You ain't never going to do it right. Why? Because you're human. Just like those people looking for the perfect church. Pastor, I'm leaving your church. It's just not what I was looking for. I'm looking for the perfect church. Well, please don't go to the one down the street because you'll ruin it. I think I found a perfect church. Well, don't go there because as soon as you get there, it ain't perfect no more. Come on, somebody. Don't wait for ideal circumstances. Don't wait till you think that you got it all lined up and fixed and you you know don't even wait till you prayed up. Just say Jesus have mercy on me. It's a it's a it's a, a small little phrase. Jesus have mercy on me. What are you saying to God? Is God, I know that I'm not where I need to be. I know I have allowed things to keep me from your best. I know that I've allowed this. Listen, I don't know what it is that's keeping you from God's best today, but I know it's here, and I know that he's here, and I know that if we would yield to him, he's bigger than your thing. Come on, somebody. And if you would just simply say, Jesus, have mercy on me. He knows, you are, he knows you're not perfect. He knows you make mistakes. He knows where you've messed up. You don't even have to admit it. All you got to do is come to him and say, have mercy on me. And he's there to listen. He's there to respond. He's there to touch. He's there to heal. He's there to set free. Number six. This is awesome. Believe that you can change. That's called faith. Believe that you can change. Verse 41. Say, said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Mark chapter 10, it says, so Jesus answered and said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabboni, teacher, that I may receive my sight. Have faith that your current situation doesn't have to be your permanent or final one. Have enough faith that, that you must believe that God can and he will. Come on, somebody. What, 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 did, what did Jesus say made this guy well? What? Ain't trick question. It wasn't his asking. It wasn't because he did three Hail Marys. It wasn't because he did everything right that day or that week or that month. It wasn't that he lined everything up perfect. Come on, somebody. 
Why, did he, why was he made well? Because he was willing to reach out by faith. Come on, somebody. He was willing to understand that my current situation doesn't have to be my future one. Why? Because Jesus, it's not who you are, what you've done, what you deserve. Come on. It's who he is, what he did, and what he deserves. Isn't it awesome that he gives you what he deserves? Man, that's a good, good father. That's a good, listen, a father always wants to do right by his kids and always give them better than what they have. Man, we have the best father in heaven who doesn't give us by what we deserve. He gives us by what he deserves. You've got to be willing to reach out in faith. Somebody say faith. You've got to be willing to reach out and believe that you can change. Now, here's my favorite part of the whole story. Number seven. Do something bold and dramatic to show God you mean business. Let me tell you something. Faith is never a mental thing. Faith is never a noun. It's always a verb. It's always an action. It's not what you believe. It's what you do. Come on, somebody. Some people think faith is what what I can believe. I don't know about you. Do you guys remember the, the original Karate Kid? Wax on and wax off. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Some people, they think that's what faith is all about. That faith is just, (sighs) if I can get myself to believe it. I don't know about you, but I've tried. Man, I've I've, I've done the spiritual calisthenics. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I don't care how hard you try. Faith is simply taking God at his word, not at yours. It's that simple. People try to make faith way more complicated than it ever needs to be. How do I know it's taking God at his word? Jesus taught his disciples this lesson when he said, hey, guys, let's get on the boat, go to the other side. They got in the boat. They're going to the other side. Where was Jesus? Snoozing. Afternoon siesta. Man, the older you get, there ain't nothing like it. Hallelujah. He was just he was just staring at the backside of his eyelids, down there in comfort. All hell's breaking loose on, on the upper deck. And these professional fishermen who understood these waters and had navigated them a whole life were freaking out. And then they get in an argument as they're bailing out water. And they said, Man, where's Jesus? Don't he care that we're dying? And we don't know who went down, but if I had to guess, it was Peter because he always did stuff like this. Yeah. I'll go down there and set him straight. He gets down there anyway. Jesus, wake up. Don't you care that we're dying? Man, I remember this Sunday school story. I thought, man, Jesus wakes up just like I do. He was in a bad mood. He woke up and the first thing he said is, oh, ye of little faith. How long I got to put up with you? That sounds like a bad mood, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, well, I don't mind. Why did he say that? Why? Because he said, let's go to the other side. And if Jesus said, let's go to the other side, then I don't care what hell happens between here and there. You're going to get to the other side. Stop letting your eyes deceive you, your feelings and your emotions deceive you, and believe what God has said. He said, you're getting there, you're getting there. Faith is simply taking God at his word, Period. No ifs, no ands, no buts. One of my favorite preachers of all time is Smith Wigglesworth, and here's what he said. I choose to believe it. And for me, it's settled. God says, faith is simply taking God at his word. Let's get back to the blind guy. Everybody walking through and they're giving their alms, I'm sure people have their favorites, right? This cloak was the blind man's identifier. This cloak is what identified him as blind Barnabas. There weren't name badges. He wore this cloak. And every day he would take this cloak. He would be led down. He would take his cloak and he would put it out. And this was his spot. And I'm sure that he had been there for so long that, that the other ones had died and already. And he, and he, and he kept graduating to the. He, I, I imagine he probably had the best spot of all the beggars. 
And his cloak identified who he was. And there's people came by and said, oh, there's Bartimaeus. Again, I want to help old Bartimaeus. I like old Bartimaeus. And started giving him some alms and things. And he has this identifier. And he has it there. It's his spot. It's his place. And when Jesus went by, he said, what's going on? It's Jesus. What's he doing? Son of David, have mercy. Now, people tell him, shh, be quiet, man. He's busy. He's busy. He's busy. He said it all the more. He said it louder. Son of David. Now, I love this. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, don't you think it was obvious? The man is blind. Why did Jesus ask him the question? When he already knew the answer. Why did the angel of the Lord ask Jacob, what's your name? Do you not think he knew his name? He had to confess who he was. My name is Jacob. I'm a surplanter. I'm a deceiver. I'm a heel grabber. But I don't want to be that anymore. What do you want me to do? Listen to this. That I might receive my sight. Now look at the story. The man got up. They didn't have Walmart. They have Goodwill. They had Plato's Closet. They didn't have thrift shops. They didn't have churches going around giving out clothes. This thing was valuable. It identified who he was. It identified his position in life. It identified and saved his place where he was a beggar for his whole life. But the Bible says he got up and he threw aside his cloak to say, here, boys, you can have it because I'm not coming back. Some of us have got to do something bold and dramatic to show God that I am taking you at your word and I'm not going back again. I'm not going back. Some of you here this morning, you know that God has done things in your life and you kind of know that you know where God wants you to be and whatever it is is getting you caught in this spiritual cycle this spiritual rut of getting caught in the same stuff over and over and over again and I'm here to tell you that if you would be willing this morning to identify that he is here if you'd be willing to take him simply at his word if you'd be willing to take those things that you've identified for years and throw them aside and say you know what I'm going to do something bold and dramatic because I'm not coming back if he would have kept his code, he would have had something to tie him to his past. He would have kept his, well, I'm going to keep this just in case it don't work. That's why there's so many blind, begging Christians in the world. Because when they come to God, they want to keep their hold on that old way of thinking and that old life and their old, the, 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 the old, they want to try to hold, listen to this, I, I, I love, you guys, have you ever had Blaine, Christine Bowman? Been a while, Blaine Bowman, Blaine Bowman used to say this and I love it, he says, he who rides the fence will surely rip his drawers. Men, ain't nothing more comfortable than trying to ride a fence. One on one side, one on the other, Running down the fence line, there's going to be a post coming eventually, and you can draw the conclusion of what happens after that. Come on, somebody. But how many of us Christians try to live our life that way? God says, you know what? I want you to give it up. I want you to give it up. Well, I've asked them to forgive me, and I forgive them. Then why have I heard about it 35 times in the last two weeks? Well, I forgive them, but I'm not going to forget it. Aren't you glad that Jesus don't forgive you like that? When I was a kid, I, I talked a lot. That's probably why I'm a preacher. And I had my name on the board so many times that when they walk up to the blackboard and erase my name, the next day you come in, you can still see my name. And all the teacher does is walk up there and just trace right back over where my name was. My name was in the same place every day for two years. Aren't you glad that when God wipes it away, it's to remember it no more? You might remember it. Others might remember it, but that doesn't really matter. He doesn't remember it. It's time to throw it off once and for all. It's time to take the cloak off, throw it back, and tell old boys, you can keep it if you want it because I'm not coming back anymore. Two more things, and I want to pray for you. Write these down. Two more. Two more. Hallelujah. Clarify what you need. Really 
clarify what you need. What do you want me to do for you, Lord, that I may receive my sight? Be specific. Don't beat around the bush. Be bold. Be honest. Sometimes we think that maybe God hasn't figured it out yet. He knows. He knows. You may have not admitted it to yourself, but he knows before you even knew it. So be willing to clarify exactly what you need. Lord, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time forgiving my father for the things that he did. And it's affected me my entire life. And every time when I think I'm free, I get pulled back into that same rut. And it pulls me back to that same old mud pit. And it gets me wallowing that same old self-pity and whatever it is that you're wallowing in. I'm here to tell you, folks, we've got to be bold to the Lord and say, listen, throw that thing off and clarify. God, I need to be delivered from that and be specific about it. I had a lady every time I had a, for years, planted a church in a rural town in Indiana, and, man, every time I had an altar call, this lady would come up. I don't care if I was praying for ingrown toenails. She showed up. And every time, praying for a husband, praying for a man. Oh, pastor, pray with me. I'm praying for a man. I'd say, what kind of man you want? I just want a man. Wow. Well, she got one. And she couldn't quit complaining about the man. And I remember asking one time, man, you're praying three years for a man. A man shows up, now you complain. Well, I didn't want that man. Well, you didn't ask for a specific man. You just asked for a man. And God knows the difference between a man and a woman. Some of you will get that one tomorrow. <laughs> Listen to me. You got to be willing to be specific. Be willing. Because here's what. Being specific with God will clarify in your own mind exactly what faith you need to tap into. God, this happened to me when I was 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever it is. This happened. I've yet to get over it, and I find that every once in a while I get caught in that same rut. It drags me back to that same pit. My stinking thinking curls up, and it causes me all these issues. And finally I come to you, and you help deliver me and set me free. But you know what? I keep going back to it. I keep going. Do something bold and dramatic. Now, what does that look like? It's going to look different to different people. I know I had to do something bold in my life. At 15 and a half years old, I had one hair growing out of my chest, and I just knew I was a man. And I thought I'd tell God the way it was. And I got to the place where, man, I went to the altar, and I had to get really specific with God. And I had to get real, I had to clarify. Because, listen, it's not because he needs clarity. It's because you need clarity. And I had to clarify, God, this is what is affecting me. This is what is causing my issues. But I want you to know that I am laying it down and I am not coming back to pick it up. This is the last time. I can't tell you how many times I'd laid at the altar and I'd, I'd, I'd be in the parking lot and think, oh, man, son, I feel, what's going on? Something's missing. I'd come back in, pick it back up, and put it on again. I'd have moments of freedom, moments of clarity, moments of, of, of just bliss. But I would pick that garbage back up. and Why do we do that? That's why the Bible talks about pig returning to its, to its mud pit and a dog eating its own vomit. That's what the Bible talks about. It's human nature. We've got to, we've got to understand that, yes, you're a human, but you're, you're only a human second. You're a child of God first. And you're not bound by the things of this nature because you've accepted Jesus. And you don't have to be bound by that, that flesh of yours anymore. Do something bold and dramatic and clarify, this is what I need, and I'm laying it down, and I'm not picking it up again. Let's move on. There's a couple more, and I want to pray with you. After you get out of the rut, you got to be willing to go the right way. Verse 43, and immediately he received a sight. And then he went back down and hung out with the beggars. Is that what it says? He kept the same company. Uh-uh. What does it say? He followed Jesus, started glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, began to praise God. Come on, somebody. They're like, whoa, this dude was blind, and now he sees. He, listen, he did not hang out with the beggars anymore. Listen to me. Verse 52 of Mark chapter 10, that Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well, and immediately received a sight, and he followed Jesus on the road. 
I'm telling you, for some of you, the only way you're going to stay free is change your company. The reason why so many of us suffer with stinking thinking is because we're hanging out with people who love stinking thinking. We've got to be willing to change our company. We've got to be willing to change our surroundings. We've got to be willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to go that way anymore. I'm going to be willing to change who I hang out with. Jesus, he started following after Jesus. How many knows when you're following after Jesus, you've got a good crowd you're running with? Now you're running with men who've witnessed the power of God, the miracles of God, and the healings of God. Last but not least, drop this one down. This is important, and then I want to pray with you. Always return the glory to God, to whom it belongs. Verse 43, and immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And the people, when they saw it, gave, gave praise to God. You will quickly fall back into the same rut if you're not returning the glory to God. Only God, listen, only God can receive the, the glory for getting you out of your rut. Returning all glory to him will cause other people to worship the right one. If you start taking credit for it, look out. You're heading back to the beggars. You can't take credit. Listen, I was divinely touched by the Lord. Ask yourself, are you causing people to praise him or are you causing people to walk away from him? You're doing one or two things in your life. You're causing people to praise him or you're causing people to not praise him. Stand to your feet with me. Pastor, I don't know what time you normally get out. Probably earlier than this. I like how you have that clock back there. The church I pastor, they took the clock down and put up a calendar. <laughs> Make sure I got out, in this, out on the right day. Listen to me. It's not who is here in the physical that will change your situation. I didn't show up with revival in my suitcase. But I showed up with Jesus. And the Bible says, Greater is he that's in me than he that is in this world. I showed up with the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor, the paraclete, the helper, the healer. And he's here. He is here right now. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to close your eyes just for a moment. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I know that Time is getting.